One of the interesting applications of linear equations is their use in modeling real-life situations. And we would call these linear models, and we're emphasizing three different things in this, in this phrase, in, in the idea of a linear model. Um, first of all, the concept of being a model implies that this is approximating or representing some sort of a real-life situation. So our goal in this case is to um, represent the situation mathematically, usually through an equation, but with the understanding that the equation may only be accurate to a certain extent. So for instance, I might be able to describe the amount of Tylenol in a person's bloodstream after a certain number of hours, uh, but I may only be able to do that for a certain number of hours before my equation no longer reflects the, the true situation. Or I may realize that it's an approximate model for an average person, but I realize that there are some variations depending on, um, depending on each person. So there are many reasons why your model might not actually uh, be perfect and be perfectly representative of that real life situation, but it's still useful in helping you um, solve problems and make predictions. So we, we still want to look at these models, just realize that there is some approximation involved. There are two other things that make a linear model a uh, linear and a model. First of all, it needs to relate two variables, an independent variable and a dependent variable. In the Tylenol example, the amount of Tylenol in the bloodstream would be dependent on the, on the time. So in this case, our two variables would be the time, right, T for time, and uh, we'll call it, um, let's say, A for amount of Tylenol. Uh, other situations would be uh, maybe the number of, um, the number of flowers that can be pollinated in an hour would depend on the number of bees that are in the area. So in that case, the the bees would be independent, and it's the flowers that can be pollinated that depend on how many bees there are. And you'll see a variety of different situations. Um, we could talk about distance. A person's distance from home depends on how many hours they've been traveling. The cost of an item depends on all of the different you know, amounts of supplies that are necessary to, to make that um, make that item, and various situations like that. And then the third aspect of a linear model, it needs to have a constant rate of change, and this is this is what makes it linear. So we have other types of models. We can talk about um, exponential models for um, situations in which um, something would grow exponentially or, or decrease exponentially, but a, a linear model has a constant rate of change. So your rate of change, that's another way of, of talking about the slope, slope of a line or the, the slope of this equation. And we're talking about the change in the dependent variable as compared to the change in the independent variable. And we would want that, that slope to be constant, meaning equal to a fixed number, um, no matter which specific values of the, the variables that you look at. All right, so for instance, if we had, um, you know, maybe, maybe your y value increases by 6 and your x, ver x value um, increases by 3, then we would say that this is a slope or a rate of change of 6 thirds or 2. And this would work um, even if we increased the y value by 12, maybe, and the x value increased by 6, then if we compare those two values to each other, we can still see that they have that, that same rate of change. As one increases by 12, the other increases by 6, is the same thing as saying one increases by 6 and the other by 3, or even our final number here is saying uh, the, the y value increases by 2 and the x variable increases by 1. All right, so let's look at what this looks like on a graph. Um, let's just choose a value to start with. So let's say we have 
the value 1, 3. All right, so this point represents an x value of 1 and a y value of 3. All right, so if we were talking about um, you know, time here, maybe after one hour, three units of some product are produced. Right? And then in a constant rate of change, this would mean that every time we um, increase x by a certain amount, we would increase the y value by a constant amount as well. Right? So let's say that every time x increases by one unit, maybe your y value increases by four units. All right, so um, with, one, with one more hour of time, maybe we can produce four more units of whatever this product is. All right, well then in a constant rate of change, that would mean that every time we add an hour, we should be able to add one, two, three, four more units of product. All right, so we're kind of going over one unit of time and increasing our product by four units. Okay, increasing our time by one unit, increasing our product by four units. And if you notice, you should start to see that these points are going to line up on a line. Let's see if I can draw this. All right, and there it is. Okay, so if you're testing to see if, if a rate of change is linear, one option would be to, to look at a graph and see if all of those different um, values for x and y line up on a line. The other test that you can do is um, see if the, if the changes, uh, all right, if the changes are proportional to each other. All right, so notice we talked about increasing by one unit of time and that means that we can increase by four units of product. All right, and then we might want to look at what happens if we increase by two units of time. All right, so from one to three, it looks like we increased from three units of product all the way up to, what is this, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, up to 15 units of product. All right, so that was an increase of, all right, oh, and that actually, actually at three, I think we're up here, here instead, we're at 11 units of product. All right, so we've increased from three to 11, an increase of eight units. All right, and then you can check those and see um, four to one is the same thing as eight to two. What would something look like if it's not a linear model or not a constant rate of change? Well, this would happen in, in a couple situations. Um, here's one. Let's say that every time your one variable increases by one unit, um, let's say it, it starts off slowly at first. Um, let's say we have zero, zero. And then when we increase maybe the time, let's say x is time. And let's talk about maybe population. All right, so after one year, maybe the population increases by um, a small amount of people. All right, and then let's say that um, after another year, uh, maybe the population is growing and we increase by uh, more. And then the third year, maybe we increase by quite a bit more. And the fourth year, by even more. So if you kind of connect these dots, what happens is that you end up with a curve because one variable is increasing more rapidly than the other. All right, so a constant rate of change, each variable is increasing at the, the same rate, not one more rapidly than the other. All right, um, there are two forms that we'll look at for linear models, and these are just the two forms of a linear equation. Um, you've already looked at y equals mx plus b, your slope-intercept form. And in this equation, we have 
um, the slope or the rate of change is apparent, it's the number being multiplied by the x. And then you also have a y-intercept. Right, just a reminder, the y-intercept is where um, the line crosses the y-axis. So at that point, the x value would be 0. All right, and then in standard form, ax plus by equals c, we have numbers being multiplied by the, the two variables. And then we have um, both of those things being added together to equal some sort of a fixed number or a constant on the right-hand side. So both of these equations, um, both of these forms are, are important when we uh, model different situations, depending on the information that's given to begin with. So let's look at a couple examples. All right, from 1985 through 1997, the number of movie theaters in the United States increased by about 750 per year. In 1993, there were about 26,000 theaters. Write a linear model for the number of theaters, y, and let t equal 0 represent 1985. All right, so first of all, you're told that this is a linear model, but even if they had not told you that in the problem, we would be able to, to know that based on um, a key phrase here, this phrase about um, increased by about 750 per year. Right, so this is telling you that as, as the years increase by 1, as t goes up by 1, the number of theaters, y, increases by 750. All right, so this is telling you that the, the rate of change is constant. All right, well, we would never have a year in which um, one year has been added and the number of theaters increases by a thousand. Right, they're telling you it's the same every year. Okay, so to write a linear model, we need two variables, and we're told what those are. We have y, the number of theaters, and we have t, and t is the number of years. Um, not the year itself, but notice that since t equals 0 represents 1985, then t represents the years since 1985. Right, so when t, is, when t is 1, this actually represents the year 1986, right, or one year since 1985. Okay, so uh, we have a we have a rate of change, and that's your clue that the the linear model that we might want to use would be that form y equals mx plus b. All right, so let's start filling in what we know into this equation, and our goal is just to uh, replace this slope and intercept with numbers so that we have an equation that shows the relationship between the y and the x. All right, so right now we know that the, the slope, the rate of change, is 750 theaters per year. And I'll switch over and start using a t instead of an x, since we are looking for a relationship between t and y. Now the other number that I need to find is this y-intercept, and I don't have that. So if I look back through my equation, I have um, some other numbers here from 1985 through 1997, and let's see, that's just telling me, that's giving me uh, the years for which this, this model will accurately represent the situation. So once, it, once we pass 1997, this model may no longer be accurate. All right, uh, we've already used 750 theaters per year. And then we have this new piece of information. In 1993, there were about 26,000 theaters. All right, so, so look for different numbers here. And, and 1993 is a time. And if we, we put this in terms of T, 1993 would be eight years since 1985. All right, so 1993 is when T equals eight. 
And in that year, they're telling us that the, the number of theaters, the Y value, is 26,000. Right, so what they've given you here is a, a point in this equation. They've given you the point 8, 26,000. So if we were trying to find the y-intercept, one way to do this would be to plug in values for y and t and then solve to find uh, the y-intercept. Right, so let's do this. Now we know that when y is 26,000, All right, our, our t or our time is 8. All right, and then we just need to solve for b. So we have 26,000 equals, equals 6,000 plus b, and then subtracting 6,000 from each side, I see that b is 20,000. All right, so if I wanted to write a linear model for this, for the number of theaters, I would say that y equals 750t plus 20,000. And that's my linear model. Okay, so let me rewrite that. So once we have a linear model, um, the, the purpose of this is to model the situation, but also to make predictions, usually about the future or sometimes about the past. So they might also follow up um, these directions with some questions. So for example, um, what does the slope represent in the context of the problem? All right, and th in this case, they gave you that, right? The slope represents the number of theaters or the increase in the number of theaters per year. Right, so slope will always represent some sort of a, a rate of change. All right, so this is indicating a theater's increase by 750 per year. You might also be asked about the y-intercept. What does that mean in the context of the problem? All right, well, notice a y-intercept, we, we talked about this earlier, y-intercept is the point zero, in this case, zero, 20,000, right? So in this case, the y-intercept represents the y-value that matches a t-value of zero, All right? Well, when is t zero? t is zero in 1985. So the y-intercept gives you the number of theaters in 1985. So the y-intercept will always give you um, some sort of a, um, a, a value for the, the, one, the one variable, the y variable, whenever the independent variable is zero. All right, so a lot of times this is like a starting place, and that's why um, we consider that y-intercept to be interesting or important, important. Using a linear model, we can also answer questions about either of these variables. So for instance, how many theaters will there be in 2000? Right, and we can use this equation, but keep in mind that we were told uh, that this, this equation only modeled accurately the years through 1997. Right, so let's look at, look at what happens here and see uh, what we think about the accuracy of this value. Right, so how many theaters, meaning find the y value, in 2000, and that's 15 years after 1985. Right, so what we would do is just substitute in our value for t and solve to find the matching value for y. All right, so we would have y equals 11,250 plus 20,000 or 31,250. And since it's now past 2,000, you might be able to look up this fact and see if this equation was accurate or if this was wildly off uh, from, from the actual number. All right, let's look at another equation and another situation. Uh, you are buying vegetables to make a vegetable tray for a party. 
you buy $10 worth of cauliflower and broccoli. The cauliflower costs $2 per pound and broccoli costs $1.25 per pound. Write an equation in standard form, that's AX plus BY equals C, that represents the different amounts in pounds of cauliflower and broccoli that you could buy. All right, so even if, if I hadn't been told that the equation could be in standard form, um, I might be able to see that from, from the information that's given. So notice I have two unknowns, two variables. I have cauliflower and broccoli. And then I have um, certain amounts of those would, would add up to a total of $10 being spent. All right. So if you see that um, you have kind of two parts or two small pieces of a whole being added together, that might be a clue that you should use the standard form. All right, so let's think about this. Um, let's say we bought a pound, let's say a pound of cauliflower and three pounds of broccoli. And we want to know how much that costs. All right, well, we know cauliflower is $2 per pound. So that's a total of $2. Broccoli was $1.25 per pound. So that would be a total of $3.75 for the broccoli. And altogether, that would only give us $5.75 worth of vegetables when we wanted $10 worth of vegetables. So obviously these numbers are too small, but this kind of gives us a, a clue into the process for setting up this equation. Um, notice that whatever my pounds of cauliflower are and whatever my pounds of broccoli that I'm purchasing, um, if I multiply those by the, the cost per pound, then I get the total amounts that I'm spending on each of these vegetables. And when I add these up, I get my total amount spent all together. All right? So all I really need to do to turn this into a, an equation is just replace those specific values of pounds for cauliflower and broccoli with variables to represent the fact that I don't know exactly how many pounds of each I'm purchasing. All right? But the process would still be the same. Whatever my pounds of cauliflower are, I would multiply them times $2 per pound Broccoli would be multiplied by $1.25 per pound. And then I would add those two amounts together to equal my total, which in this case I'm told has to equal $10. All right, so that's an equation in standard form. 2C plus 1.25B equals 10. All right, and once we have that, um, we can, again, use this model to answer certain questions. All right, so first of all, we might be interested to know um, if we buy zero pounds of cauliflower, how many pounds of broccoli would we need to buy? All right, so if my cauliflower is zero, and if I still need to buy $10 worth of vegetables, then 1.25b must equal 10, and if, I, if you use a calculator to divide by 1.25, you find that you would need to buy, look at my calculator, 10 divided by 1.25, you would need to buy 8 pounds of broccoli. Alright, so that's one option. Um, we might also be curious to know if we buy no broccoli, how many pounds of cauliflower would we need to buy? All right, so in this case, the broccoli is zero. And we are solving for the pounds of cauliflower. All right, so I'd have 2C equals 10, or C equals 5. All right, so we could buy 5 pounds of cauliflower if we buy no broccoli. All right, so these are the these are the intercepts, intercepts of your equation, and those are important because um, they give you the, the amounts of one variable when the other va variable is zero. 
So you'll often see this type of question asked when you have an equation in standard form. And you may notice that it's a little harder in this case to, to talk about the rate of change or the slope um, because it's not in slope intercept form. So, so often if we wanted to know about the slope or the intercept, you might look at a different situation or a different form of the equation than if you're curious about the intercepts. All right, so watch for, for questions like this as you go through. Um, usually you're being directed to one of the important parts of the equation, either the slope, a y-intercept, or an x-intercept.